Hi, welcome. My name is Eric Nathan. I'm the composer in residence of the New England Philharmonic. Hi, I'm Danny Madden. I'm the concertmaster of the New England Philharmonic. And we welcome you to listening in a deep dive into the music with the NEP. It's a series where we speak to composers and performers about their art and work, but it's also a way for to help our audiences hear this music, um, taking a step behind the scenes to see how it's made, what's inspired it, and how performance of it have come together. And so this season we've been featuring composers that, have, that are being performed by the NEP. And you can go on our website on the Listening In tab to see archive videos and also to see the upcoming broadcasts um, after today's with George Santakis. We have Chen Yi and Igor Santos coming up later this spring. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome George Santakis, a composer who has been recipient of two of the top awards in the classical music field for composition, the Gramwire Award in 2005 for his second violin concerto and the 2007 Charles Ives Living Award from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. Um, he studied with Roger Sessions at Juilliard and in Rome with Franco Donatoni. He was born in Astoria, New York. With yeah. And, uh, and now he teaches at Bard College and he um, has had works played by the world's leading ensembles. Uh, we'll be listening today a piece uh, commissioned by the Boston Symphony and Chamber Music Society of Lincoln Center and Dallas Symphony Orchestra. And uh, he was in residence at Aspen for many years, and it's where I first met him. And he was my composition teacher there for a summer, I think now 17 years ago. And how time has oh, wow. flown. <laughs> so we really are so grateful that you're here with us today to speak a little bit about your music. Thanks, Eric. Well, I'm actually here today. <laughs> yeah. I'm at home, and we're all at home, which is great. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. I mean, uh, it's nice to talk about the music, but it's it's nice to have great musicians playing this music. So uh, that allows us to speak more eloquently when we're talking to you. And I know both you and Danny have quite, I just met Danny online today. And of course, Eric, yeah, we uh, you were a student of mine at Aspen a long time ago. My goodness, amazing. So thank you. Yes, and so um, George's violin concerto number three will be performed by Danny Madden, the New England Philharmonic's concertmaster, uh, conductor, music director, finalist Nicholas de Maison, and the NEP on February 26, 8 p.m. in Boston. So we're really looking forward to that. So, of course, um, we are rehearsing like mad on the program and we just came fresh from a rehearsal of your violin concerto number three this Sunday night and uh, we are so enjoying working on it George. Um, I mean what I enjoy about it of course the violin solo part is beautiful and challenging and it really uses the full range of the violin from the highest high to the to the bottom which is gorgeous the way you score it the orchestra, what they're enjoying about it, it's a very detailed and distinctive um, orchestral score, very much a partner uh, of the soloist and very, um, very atmospheric. And I was wondering, feeling like as I'm playing through it with the orchestra, it feels like a journey, it feels like I'm going somewhere. Uh, what was your thought as you were composing it? Well, first of all, thank you so much for those comments. I mean, it's so important that the musicians get it, you know, and that the, you, the soloist, gets it. I, I, I guess that had to happen, and Eric got it to recommend it. Not everybody gets every composer, and, uh, you know, there's no accounting for taste. So we uh, sometimes, if you think about who, who do we write for, uh, we don't really write just for ourselves, That you know, that who wants to listen to that, and we don't, well, some of us write for everybody, trying to reach everybody, but I don't, you know. And, and when it comes down to it, I think a uh, composer writes for people like them, you know, or him or, she, or him, he or she. Um, but, you know, what you think about while you're writing a piece uh, is, is hard to describe. But first of all, how many uh, composers have violin number three? That's the first consideration. What do you think about? You think about, well, I don't want it to be like number one. 
and I don't want it to be like number two. So that's that really is something you think about. I happen to be a composer that writes for performers, musicians that are not particularly contemporary music uh, freaks, but they can play contemporary music really well. So that's why I have three violin concertos and four piano quartets. You know, I keep saying, doesn't anyone want like a piano trio for a change? But, um, so I was thinking about what to do differently in this third concerto. And I guess you start composing. The, and the most important thing that, that Stravinsky used to say, he shuddered at a blank sheet of paper. Well, I, I prepare, instead of a blank piece of paper, there's a mood. I think we start with a mood. And uh, if a composer can create a mood, that's, you know, half the battle, because eventually, even though there's detail, there's a narrative, there could be a story, there could be a painting that you're influenced by, it's the mood. And no one explained that better than Debussy, let's say. And he's a, he's a great, uh, you know, a hero of mine, that the mood controls everything. Now, what you do within that mood, uh, because that's what you got, you have a mood and, and it's hard to change moods, by the way. It's like, no, uh, we want a celebratory piece. We want it to be happy. Well, then you're writing against your mood or maybe you're looking for a mood or like a film composer, you have to find the mood that suits the, the film, you know, and some people are adept at that. What I love about being uh, a serious, what I mean, what do we call it? Art art the composer is that they want us to do whatever we want, you know, and, and therefore I tell young composers like Eric used to be, and one, he's a wonderful composer, by the way, one of my success <laughs> stories, at least in the few weeks we had in Aspen, um, is that, uh, you know, you only got one shot. So you really have to follow your mood in each piece uh, take what is given instead of fighting, uh, fighting the piece, listen to what in, in, inside what is given. So with this concerto, I started composing fragments of, of ideas, knowing it, there was a dreamlike sense to it and wondering where I was going throughout the piece. And I think what happens in this piece is that there are uh, signals, signs given that culminate in the source of the, what I call nostalgia of the piece. So I begin with a mood and the mood leads me to, to uh, you know, the consequence of the piece in a way. Uh, but you just start composing and I have faith that it will unfold. And sometimes you get the right answer, the consequence at the last minute, at the last second. And uh, I think with this piece probably got it at the golden mean, about two thirds of way writing through it, I say, now I know where, why I'm doing this, you know? And it, you ask about the, the scherzo. The scherzo was the, the, the banging it out and saying, okay, you've got to come up with why you have this piece, you know? And it's a maniacal scherzo. And that scherzo sets up uh, the consequence of the piece. But I think that scherzo came from uh, the visions or whatever, the moods that were created before. So I think it's organic that way. Yeah, thank you. I also forgot to mention at the beginning today that we, if you're watching on YouTube, you can sign in through Google to, or YouTube to participate in the chat. You can post questions and we'll be getting to these at the end of today, but also if you post them along the way, we may um, work them in. And I see there is a question that um, asks about the, it feel like, this person says, I feel I hear sly references to the Sibelius violin concerto in the first and second movements. Am I, am, am I imagining that or are the references intentional? And this piece is also programmed alongside Sibelius's Fifth Symphony. So, um, you know, you mentioned Debussy. Do you, has Sibelius influenced your work or this? Only, piece? no, I mean, certainly not in this piece, but I, I mean, I think there are episodes that are certainly more like Sibelius than they are Tchaikovsky or, or you know, uh, other uh, contemporary composers too. So in the sense of learning from Sibelius how to relax and just let the line open up, you know, let, there's no hurry, you know, to have a broader line. And I learned from Roger Sessions who also believed in a long line, but Sessions music was so busy all the time 
there was a long line, but there was a lot of busyness going on. Uh, Sibelius, it's all just huge gestures. It sounds like this is somebody that has heard the piece or is playing in the orchestra or something. I don't know who's asking the question, but it's a it's good a question. question. Happens to be not consciously, but uh, uh, I mean, I let my subconscious come up with whatever it wants. So uh, some listeners know better than I do what is in the piece, let's put it that way. The, um, that was our principal percussionist, Jeremy Lang, asking the question. So he's been there every week with us and, and pondering these things as we're rehearsing it. Um, and by the way, he got in touch with me and asking for, you know, getting ahead with the percussion. He wanted to see the parts or hear a recording. And that is, I mean, that's, his, that, that's the best thing you can ask a composer is, can we study your piece? So that's, uh, thank you, Jeremy, appreciate that. One uh, really notable uh, thing about your concerto number three uh, for listeners and those who might come to the concert um, is the, the song theme that you quote at the end of the piece, but which really imbues um, the entire piece. And we have a clip from our rehearsal on Sunday night uh, where we're playing uh, the, the song theme in its entirety. Uh, it starts with a, a sort of a call and response from the violin and the horn in a very, uh, very beautiful way. And we're wondering uh, if we could play this clip and uh, you, you can see on the screen that George writes the chords of the tune above the notes as you might have in a jazz chart or a guitar chart. And what is um, the, the song, yeah, I mean, this is the, uh, the, the, what do they call it? The fake book. Oh. <laughs> My own tunes, fake book. So uh, you got the chords. I, I should have put the guitar uh, tablature up there too, so you could play the chords. But yeah, it's real. It's a song that I wrote. And actually, I don't know, Danny, if I ever sent you the complete with the B section of this song. This is from this. Oh, I see. This is actually from the piece. Yeah. This never gets to the B section of the piece, which is part of the plan is that something the nostalgia itself is incomplete in a way you know it's sad it's kind of sad but hardening at the same time but it does imply that you have a, things go on they're not finished right wow. thinking of the long line and and here or the, the chord changes here for composing a real tune um so let's take a listen and, and watch this uh, rehearsal clip from just Sunday night of the orchestra playing through this.
So in beautiful. And nice. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I just want to say that, uh, of course, this comes after about 17 minutes of all kinds of stuff. And it wasn't me meant to be eclectic. Uh, you really have to hear what, what happens before it to understand. But Danny, I mean, I, I, of course, they're miking you close. But when you begin that, of course, there's just these kind of almost electronic music sounds in the orchestra that you emerge out of this kind of uh, deconstruction. Something just crashed and you're in the smoke is rising. Uh, but you you should hardly be heard at first. In other words, when you start playing, I mean, I'm, I'm saying, well, the, the audience will not hear you that loud. You'll, you'll, you'll be, they'll be seeing you play. Well, this, it looks like she's playing something very lyrical and sweet. She's kind of smiling. And, and then it will emerge. It, it very carefully telescoped to emerge at the right time. And you, we want the listener to go, wait a minute. Am I hearing something like that's pretty or, you know, that's, uh, you know. Uh, and of course there are, there are films that have this kind of thing. You know, you can hear it with all the uh, sounds in the film and you'll hear this shrouded sort, sort, sort of melodies, but that I, I don't think the film is made to cater to the, this as the, as the, the consequence as much as this piece is. In mm -hmm. other words, it is about that piece where it's not about a movie. Yeah, Danny it's, and I were, oh, sorry, Danny. Oh, go ahead, Eric. Yeah, Danny and I were, were, were um, remarking about the words that you use in your score to describe things. And there's, I think, um, disorienting that comes somewhat after this. And there's also mysterious. There's um, thinking about how this song comes in at the very end of the piece, though it feels like there are flickers of this song at the beginning of the piece and that it kind of, we finally hear it all at, at once only at the end and wondering about how mood plays into this. It feels like to me, when I hear this, there's a sense of hope, but also regret. There's a, a kind of yearning or longing, but it, it, when you, when you find the mood, is, is that the, a mood that you are feeling or is it a mood that you feel in the, the world that you're trying to inhabit while you're composing? Well, first of all, I don't believe in forwards, backwards. I think uh, uh, the mood, the, the song, which I didn't really use, uh, it's, it's like Ghost Variations, the piano piece. I, I didn't use the Mozart, the, the Mozart theme when I first started the piece. It, it, it sort of, uh, it was there before I wrote the piece and I realized that it was there for the piece, a third of the way through the piece. So in this sense, uh, the nostalgia of that, song, which is, I want it to be a little bit kind of sentimental, you know, um, that that mood was in there at the beginning of the piece, but I'm, I'm saying to myself, what, but I'm a contemporary composer, I really can't write that the whole time. I mean, but that could be the flicker of what the rest of the piece is. And I'm, I'm really glad that you, those that get it, have gotten this piece, know that the music at the end was always there. You know, it's all throughout the little, not literally, because I didn't know what was going to happen at the end, but um, it, it worked out. And I had actually written that song a couple of years before I started this piece. So, uh, and I forgot it. I forgot it. And I said, wait a minute, I think I have a song that reminds me of what I'm doing in this piece. You know, it probably sound pretty good on violin and with Danny playing, it sounded wonderful. So thank you. But although also what we left it off when it melts into kind of Alban Berg there, kind of becomes Schoenberger Berg, which is very disappointing to a lot of people. <laughs> well, so I like people have brought, they've come up to me and said, why don't you just keep doing that song? You know, I mean, uh, I said, but well, buy, yeah, buy the buy the single when it comes out. <laughs> It sort of melts away. I mean, right when that clip started, when when the tune just first came out, it had just been preceded by this crazy maniacal scherzo section, where it's like Jack Nicholson in The Shining, like all kinds of mayhem are breaking loose in the orchestra. There's like huge wailing glissandos in every section. Everyone's going, wah! And the violin is just going crazy. 
And all of this mayhem, five pages in my part, finally just melts and dissolves down into what you might think of as, as component parts of life or something. And then just as you think there's nothing happening, it's all gone to, to hell, that little glimmer of the tune starts to vine up um, you know, into in, the orchestration again. It just comes into your consciousness again that there is a solo violin line amidst all this dis You mean when, when, the, when the excerpt you played, uh, that excerpt? Yeah, yeah well, it's like defining, it's like, wh where do we go? Uh, we go back to the source. Uh, and that, uh, yeah, there's, there's what this, about 30, maybe 45 seconds of contemporary music there. And it, Eric, it's like saying, you know, I can write contemporary music too, you know. <laughs> And some, some composers would just have that, you know, it's hard to hear on the video, but live it disperses uh, very well and a lot of pulsating uh, 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 going on. Breathing, it's all breathing. It's trying to almost like reviving a patient and once re revived, they live again somehow. It de definitely is reincarnation or, or it's, you know, something to do with it, but thank you. I mean. <laughs> it's like we're deriving all these things out of this uh, piece, but I, I appreciate it. And um, I'm honored that, that you both have these ideas that that's in the piece, you know. Well, so, why don't we take a look at something that's a bit contrasting now too. It's also features a violin. Um, it's knickknacks for violin and viola. And um, know that George, you are a violist and here we have Danny here violinist and a chamber piece that are all little miniatures. Um, and I think speaking about quite different aspects of life, but still all they, 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 they have a really deep human, meaningful quality to them. Um, so I'm going to pull there, up. There are seven, there are seven of them and you, you know, people play two or three or all seven and they've been played quite a bit in Boston, by the way. Yeah, and the, this we'll be playing a recording from Chamber Music Society at Lincoln Center. It's really terrific performance. Is the video you're going to show the video or yeah, just the video? The, yeah. Okay. PBS. Um, so here we thought we we play two movements of this. One is shuffling. Um, this is the fifth one, and um, we uh, could you could first just tell us a little bit about how these pieces came to be? Well, uh, these pieces were commissioned. Uh, by Karen Dreyfus, who is Glenn Dictoro's uh, wife, who's a violist. And for his Glenn's 50th birthday, she, they, she commissioned about three or four of these knickknacks. Uh, and um, then I uh, wrote some for my buddy, Larry Dutton and Liz Lim, who are coming this weekend to go skiing. Mm -hmm. And um, then I wrote a couple others. So I'd end up with seven knickknacks. I always wanted to write more, but uh, never got around to it. But we're looking at the page. I guess we can all see this page. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it looks like, uh, sure. Uh, I, I, I didn't, you know, as a violist, I, I thought those could be coordinated well enough, you know, but does uh, uh, play players, you know, composers out there, are they going to play but a but a but a but a but a or they can really do it evenly. And I found that they really work, you know, because the, there's a synergy between the players, violin, do, 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 do. and it, it sounds like one instrument. And you'll hear the fantastic Aaron Boyd and uh, Paul Neubauer do this seamlessly with no problem. You don't have to be a virtuoso to play these, but you have to be a virtuoso to play them like it's one instrument. Yeah, they, they this there's a real dialogical quality in these and that this kind of call and response that we have and um, we go along. And again, it, it comes out, it culminates in the, in the ending where it's just harmonics, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, shuffling, other C, what is this one? So uh, Danny, I know you had something when we talked about before about this oh, section yeah. you wanted to mention. The, the way the piece starts, it's so genial and friendly uh, and Towards the middle, that section comes in, ba -dee -da -dee -da -dee, very um, intense and almost uh, 
almost angry the way the two instruments start exchanging that theme, almost like a cannon. And I was wondering, I mean, it almost sounds like an argument is breaking out when uh, the line below, what was your thought there? Well, they're knacking and not nicking, I guess, but <laughs> it's definitely an argument. You, you nailed it. I mean, it is like, you know, I can do this. No, I can do this. And uh, they fight and they agree. You know, it's like a couple. It's like a relationship. Uh, and at the beginning, they're, uh, you know, at the beginning, they're in unity to create one line. So they split evenly. You know, it's it's like a marriage in a way. It starts off, you know, this is the honeymoon. Everything is fine. And then some problems come up or some... Uh, or it's like a, a play where you have a conflict in the middle, you know, and uh, music is often that way. Certainly Beethoven. I guess this is this is a kind of Beethoven, one of my Beethoven impulses here uh, in a way. Um, so but then it's sweetening quickly. As you see, it gets uh, they calm down and start to play together. So but it's a canon, too. Right. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's take a listen to this uh, movement here played by Aaron Boyd and Paul Neubauer.
Like a, it's like it's a little at the end there's like a little popcorn wagon or something <laughs> leaving the scene. They play so well. I mean, unbelievable. It's so lucky to have those guys. Yeah, so so free. Um, so this next one um, that we're gonna play is a, is a, is a contrasting one. I, I I absolutely love this one, and I, I was when I was chatting with Danny before we were remarking about how. Uh, economical it is in its craft in that it, you're just basing on this this third rising and falling with the kind of caressing um, cradling swell and then it just goes up by a half step and comes down and these very subtle motions really are like a whole world of difference and there it's the, I get a sense of there being something about drama in this as well like like an actor and how you might turn even like in a film you you can have the cinematography up close and when you can see someone's eye just shiver or something it's like oh they really have felt something so like we mm -hmm. really come in very close on on the minuscule aspects of this like quite, quite such wide-ranging effects later and i'm curious your thoughts on on this and, and how you wrote this movement yeah this is very simple and it, it just just a little vi da -de -da -de -da -da -de -da -de da I mean, it's just this little wavering thing, you know, like a seesaw. And I love those kind of just placid, sort of like you're sailing or you're just floating. You're floating on water on your back or something. And you hear music. Um, but by the way, Eric, did you know that this is uh, exploited in... Uh, my Claire de Lune with the, the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra. It's in the last movement. It's it's expanded. Oh, this yeah. exact music. I hadn't realized that. Oh. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's it, it's so uh, twice as long. But uh, yeah, it's so simple. And the viola gets to play a solo, which is great, you know. And uh, but it's just it's mesmerizing in a way. It is a lullaby. So that's that's all I have to say. Mm -hmm. It's it's beautiful the the sort of thirds rocking back and forth as if you might rock a, a crib, um, and the the register of the viola singing the lullaby, it's so consoling. It's just that register that you would try to calm a child in that register. Everything's okay, mm -hmm. you know. So it's it's just so beautiful. Well, thank you, and I. I... I like that when it, uh, you know, if I can say I like something in my music, when it moves up and hits that minor chord, I mean, that high point, uh, I, I didn't know what, uh, I said, you know, am I just going to go to this minor chord, uh, like, but again, it's not going to the minor chord, it's what was prepared for it, so I allowed myself to do that. It's like going to the sixth chord in a ballad or something. Well, nothing you know, it, it, to this beautiful chord, does <laughs> it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It just hints uh, when you go to the minor, it just hints that maybe something happened that day that needs soothing over. Right. And it's right. this momentary moment there of just a little bit of, oh, okay, it's going to be better tomorrow. Don't think about this anymore. So I, I don't know. It's just for the economical two instruments, limited range. It's there's the whole world conjured here of of tenderness. Then, this one is a real a duo. It's a it's a duo where one is the ostinato and one gets a solo there. Uh, mm -hmm. By the way, I I have tomorrow much sweeter, and you guys guys have much sweeter tomorrow. I guess both are okay. Mm 
Oh, that was me. That was my. <laughs> we have dyslexia of my <laughs> subtitles. Yeah, glad we have the correct title here. Well, I think <laughs> I'll, I'll be looking forward to a better time of spelling tomorrow myself. Well, next next time, put lullaby. Good night. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I'll be I'll be playing this over my head tonight to 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 do better tomorrow. So here I'm. Um, to go to sleep or to sleep. Yeah, that's the sleep. That's true. So here is Good Night Lullaby, tomorrow much sweeter. Good job, the duo. Wow, beautiful yeah, playing. Beautiful. They just breathe together and it's amazing. I mean, being a musician can be an amazing thing because when you when you bond like that with other like actors in the play, you know, it's just wonderful. Yeah. Well, speaking of that, um, I wanted we're gonna play now next um your sonnets for English horn and orchestra. This was a, a piece that I heard the premiere of live. It was really fantastic to hear and it was also we saw each other after many years for the first time I think at that concert as well um, and I was rereading Robert Kurtzinger's um, excellent program notes in which he mentioned that that you were an actor and had acted in a number of Shakespearean plays and this uh, concerto or tone poem um, perhaps a better word for it um, sets uh, uses Shakespearean sonnets as the inspiration for each movement. And it's almost, you almost set them like a, a song without words where the words have inspired what the English horn is playing, but we never hear the words. So wondering how your life as a work time as an actor and, and actually engaging with Shakespeare's words in that realm, did that play a role in how you thought of this piece in the drama? And the, we've been talking about drama a lot today. Well. Yeah, well, thank you. First of all, I want to mention that it was great to see you at Symphony Hall. You came up to me when I, you know, we're in my seat and you were enthusiastic and you said something like, boy, this was like being at the premiere of Concerto for Orchestra. <laughs> and I said to my friend when he left, he said, I said, yeah, right. <laughs> OK, no, but uh, no, I appreciate it. They, they did a beautiful job. And, and Rob Sheena, I'll be staying with Rob for a couple of nights when I'm up there. Thank you, Rob, if you're listening for the housing. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, when you actually learn to recite Shakespeare, and I was in As You Like It and uh, Beatrice and Benedict, a uh, small part, but I played uh, Duke Sr., Sweet Are the Uses of Adversity, which like the toad, ugly and venomous. Uh, when you have to actually, it's like, you know, actually performing a piece of music, Danny, instead of just practicing at home. Yes. or memorizing yes. something as opposed to just playing it, memorizing it that you so that you feel like you are actually composing it or 
or actually you're the playwright, you are Shakespeare and, or you are Duke senior, that has a great effect with whatever you do with a, someone like Shakespeare. And Shakespeare is one of these, like Mozart, like Bach is so consistent in his thinking, the thread of love, aging, jealousy, death follows everything that the man did. And, uh, uh, so, yeah, I mean, sure, playing it and, and, and being nervous on stage, you know, you, you don't show it, but you're nervous on stage, you have this special energy. And then you get to read a sonnet and you say, wow, thank God I don't have to memorize this thing. <laughs> but it was, uh, it really helped to get the, pen, the, the rhythm and, and the flow in your head. And, and the last movement of uh, sonnets does actually, the English horn sings the sonnet without words, but, you know, sings every word of it. So I guess that represents that, that thing, memorization, even though you don't know the words, you memorize the tune of the words. Right, right. So, yeah. Well, this is more, more like a tone poem than it is like a concerto. And I, I wonder if you could speak for just a moment about the difference in the role of the soloist? Yeah, I think all my, I don't think I've ever written a concerto. I mean, the, I think the number three is uh, that you're playing is a tone poem, you know? I think uh, the second concerto is, 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 well, the second concerto, is, it's, that is a four, it's a suite, you know? It, it's not as much a tone poem as a suite. The first one that I wrote for Jimmy Lin, Cho Lang Lin, is definitely uh, more the most concerto of them all, but still, that's a tone poem about the Ubermensch type or the under. What's the opposite of Ubermensch? The 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 quiet uh, person that has the world around them that's obnoxious and noisy and is just trying to to be you know find himself. Uh, so that's a tone poem too. Yeah, sonnets is definitely a tone poem where I ripped off four Shakespeare poems, that's all. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and claim them to be my own in music. So, But I will say one thing, I, at the uh, Tanglewood, when they did it at Tanglewood, I was really moved because a man came up to me, he's gotta be long gone because he came up and he said, that had such meaning to me. And I, I, I learned recently that it was about, look, look man in his late sixties or 70, early so. And he said, I, I don't have long, I only have a few months to live, you know, and uh, these are consoling pieces. Of course, the poems are consoling in themselves, but he found the music to be consoling. And for somebody that doesn't have, that has that little time to live, to, to spend, you know, 10 minutes to come up and explain it to me, uh, I, I felt very honored in, in that way. So, well, yeah, I guess he got, he, he got it because he, he was there, you know, yeah. so. No, it's so beautiful about how music can touch us so deeply and, and and mean so many different things and more perhaps even going beyond what Shakespeare's words have said. And I, I'm wondering because something you mentioned earlier, you have spoken about a bit is the idea of the long line, and I feel like in this piece there's this thread of a story, but also how one note or one mood leads to another that pulls us through and I think also helps open up this very deep emotional experience that we have with your music and wondering what you mean by when you say the long line in the piece. Well, just that I, I think in general, you know, there's a lot of contemporary music that's fractured and, and busy and, and I, you know, I try to fight to get rail against that myself. I think a long line is a, is a slow release of energy. And I think that, uh, and contouring energy, bending something as opposed to, you know, a little, uh, trying to, uh, to uh, what do you call, weld the little bits of pieces together. It, you know, you make the shape first, you bend the line. And, and uh, that long line is reassuring in itself to the listener. I think people want to just hold on to something and, and let it linger and follow it as opposed to fractured uh, uh, energetic music. And then when the older you get, I think you do want longer lines, you know, mm. uh, and uh, you can, you travel longer 
mileage in cars and you, you have a lower expectation of how long it's going to take. When you're a kid, you go, my God, this is taking so long. Mm-hmm. The children have, uh, you know, little bits of time, uh, tiny bits of time. And when you get older, you do want longer lines. So there is something to be said about writing for an older audience as opposed to a younger audience. Uh, and I call that a lot of the contemporary music of young composers. They're after the shiny objects. And I call it kid stuff. Yeah, you like kid stuff, you know. Mm-hmm. And that's great when you're, when you're a kid. But uh, so who's to say at what age music should, uh, you know, procure, procure your audience? I mean, uh, you, say, you go to a concert and sometimes you'd be, Eric, you'd be the youngest guy there at a Boston Symphony concert, you know. And, uh, and you say, well, what's wrong with older people? They're wise, they, you know. So... Uh, I think Sonnets is a mature, more mature uh, piece, not f- so much for older people, but older souls, let's say. You get it. Get the, those are the souls that will get this sooner. So, uh, yeah, you just do your best, you know. But it is also a little nostalgic and somber, too, uh, not unlike the uh, third concerto. Yeah, well, I'm going to pull up the, the slides again here. We can we'll take a listen to the first movement, and this is the uh, the sonnet that we're that it's inspired by. George, would you want to give us a, a reading of this, or, or should I? Or <laughs> you can read it. Uh, uh, you can read it. This is the first movement, right? Yeah. Yeah. And wondering. by the way, you know that I r- remarked that after I set that began to set this, I realized that my teacher's name was in it. Sessions, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and that, you know, I was with Roger Sessions when the Boston Symphony did Lilacs Last in the Dooryard Bloomed uh, at Symphony Hall. And uh, I met uh, Michael Dukakis <laughs> and Sessions said, oh, well, it's my honor to introduce Syntakis to Dukakis. And he laughed, it was, uh, it was 80 years old for God's sakes. Anyway, but my hero, uh, in a way, Roger Sessions. And this is all about, you know, it's, it's serendipity in a way. But I ch- didn't choose the poem seeing Roger Sessions, just like these other events. You know, it happens later. You say, I must have chosen this poem. And there's Roger Sessions is in it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, also I'll give my, do my best here. Went to the Sessions of Sweet Silent Thought. I summon up remembrance of things past. I sigh the lack of many a thing I sought, and with old woes new wail my dear time's waste. Then can I drown an eye, unused to flow, for precious friends hid in death's statelets night, and weep afresh love's long since cancelled woe, and moan the expense of many a vanished sight. Then I can grieve at grievances foregone, and heavily from woe to woe tell o'er the sad account of forbemoaned moan which I knew pay as if not paid before. But if the while I think on thee, dear friend, all losses are restored and sorrows end. And so- Beautifully done. You, you'd make a good Benedict, by the way. Oh. <laughs> but, you know, this is what the Roger Sessions, I mean, when everything was bad, you know, I didn't know whether to shave or cut my throat, you know, nothing happening musically. Roger Sessions was my rock because he said some wonderful things when I, was terrible. When I was a terrible composer, young composer, he knew something about the character, whether I'd become a good composer or not. Didn't, it almost didn't matter. He appreciated my, I was with him for five years or four or five years. And he is my, was my confidence and, and all the losses uh, are restored and sorrows end when I think of my friend, Roger Sessions, you know? In other words, uh, didn't matter what anybody else thought. Mm. My se- my friend Roger Sessions, who was only about seventy years older than I was, uh, is my friend. You know, I believe him. Yeah, well, that's beautiful. Um, well, Danny, I don't know if you want to speak a little bit about the uh, the couplets. I'm going to move to the beginning of the the first movement here, and what we're going to just do a look at a few places of this um, piece before you listen to it. I think, George, when when you composed this, maybe you were um, maybe you were regarding 
Shakespeare's use of the four lines, then the next four lines, then the next four lines, then the conclusion, that couplet that comes at the end. And I like how um, it, both in, in the sonnet and in your music, it sort of moves from nostalgia to, uh, to darkness, wailing and moaning and, and grieving. And then at the very end, it's almost like, if I think about you, my dear friend, Ah, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that sense of, of the conclusion there, almost like uh, it, it's all made well again. Um, and that's right. isn't that a feature of a lot of his sonnets. Well, you know, the, the Shakespeare song, I have, uh, I set three of them uh, for, for a cappella choir. And that couplet at the end is a killer. It's always the killer. And I don't know, I don't remember what I did musically, but certainly in the last movement, when I said it, that couplet means an important thing. It's like a separate thing from the poem. It's like the, it's like this, the, the summary, but it's also a new thing. In other words, you, you put the, you, you add that little dagger at the end or something, or it's a concluding phrase. And this one is a gentle phrase. Um, but it, it's like the punchline of a joke, you know, uh, and, the couplet at the end. I, I think it's in the piece somewhere, but uh, I don't remember it, what I did, but I wasn't literally thinking of that, the timing, but it comes out anyway, I think, you know, subliminally. You got to depend, composers got to depend on their subliminal doing a heck of a better job than their bliminal, you know, because <laughs> That's true. Uh, we, we can't do much directly. We have to depend that there's somebody, a little helpers going on inside and while we sleep where the little elves are creating the music because, and that's why I don't take as much credit for it. And I don't think that highly of being a composer because, you know, I think that our, our subconscious gets the, you know, should get all the, all the praise when, when something like this happens, you know, we just, and you just trust it, trust it. That's all. Yeah. No, it is, it is true. It's amazing how, some of you may be banging your head against the wall one day, and I guess tomorrow much sweeter than today was. It, it, it somehow you see the light, but you don't know how you actually truly got there. Um, so here at this beginning, um, you you create this very large, as you say, ethereal large spaces like Wagner's Lohengrin opening, and all this space, little sounds, almost like um, if you're in Symphony Hall and you just hear the echoes going around. Um, then the, the English horn first enters on top of this, this bed of strings. And at the premiere, one thing that, that stuck out to me in a beautiful way, I just left the piece remembering these kind of pulsating, caressing string chords. I wonder, make me think of, are these thoughts? Um, but you, this is a motive that you bring back a, at the end of the work and also in this move, movement as well and something that I, I draw listeners attention to. Um, then right here we see this fortissimo, this loud part, this is right at the climax when dark, uh, Daniel was saying it gets very dark and strained and then you set the couplet again at the end here in this new, uh, well actually a return of the older texture with these kind of caressing string chords and in each movement we have this moment of the the two lines at the end the couplet is a in a sense a, becomes like a different um, musical section as well mm -hmm. so um let's take a listen um to this piece um just the first movement it's about eight minutes long and when we return we can uh, open it up for some questions and um, this is a recording the the boston symphony released uh Oh my goodness, ago. Eric! Eric, you're on this recording I too. We, we I never recording. didn't know. Huge <laughs> honor for me. It, no, it's a big honor record. for me to be with, with the. You know, I'm the I'm the old guy compared with on this, and I I still made it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> well, it's an honor for me to be on it with you. So okay. here is uh, Robert Sheena and Anders Nelson with the Boston Symphony playing the first movement of Sonnets.
well, you can uh, go on Spotify or go to your record store or CD store. You buy CDs, you can listen to the rest of it. It just uh, gets the appetite started. Uh, that, yeah, that's, uh, you know, that's very, I mean, maybe Sibelius there. I don't know. It's a languid movement. Of course, that, that it's not only the poem, but it sets up movements that start to move. The second movement moves faster. The third movement is very, is very quixotic. And then there's the uh, kind of poet, poetry reading by the English horn. And again, fabulous, not Boston Symphony, but not, not only them, but Rob Sheena, what an amazing player. I mean, absolutely. you got to thank your lucky stars when you have players. And not only that play that well, but ask you for the piece in the first place. Absolutely. Well, I'm going to see if there are any questions here. Um, we've been sent over um, from YouTube. Um, we have one. If you say you've never written a concerto, how would you define what a concerto is versus a tone poem? That was to you, Eric, uh, right? Oh, no, I think I think it was Jim, uh, our man the manager of the NAP, sent the question to me. But it, it's, uh, I think... I could I could try answering it, but how would you? <laughs> would you? We could both get a give a stab at it. Like, you mean if someone hasn't written a concerto, how would they define what a concerto is? Or maybe how would you define what a concerto is? Yeah, well, uh, that's you know you can look it up in in the book, but uh, uh, you know it's basically uh, it's an old Italian term that means. Uh, a, you know, one, uh, you know, performer or two would do with, uh, you know, a larger group around them. So a soloist is basic, the basic definition. Um, but uh, a concerto, yeah, it will, it means, it, to me, it means also that the, the, the soloist shows off and the composer in the old sense writes something that shows all these great flashy techniques Hmm. off of the uh, uh for the performer to shine and that's not what i consider a concerto to be so. mm -hmm. yeah it's interesting i've been writing a number of pieces in recent years with the term concerto in the title though i also have not been embracing the virtuosic well i guess i'm sure that they're all quite challenging but i think i've been embracing the tone poem realm that you have and so i guess we're both taking the term concerto as, as a title, but not maybe using it exactly the way historically been used. But other composers have, I think. By the way, I mean, I'm sorry, but I hate cadenzas. <laughs> I really don't like cadenzas. I mean, I'm not crazy about extended uh, guitar solos in rock either. You know, just, uh, but cadenzas, I mean, they sort of ruin the piece to me. It is a, a place for the soloists to, to shine. And if these soloists today would write their own cadenzas, it would be much more interesting. But to play, uh, you know, a patented cadenza for these concertos, Mozart, Beethoven, whatever, it's just not interesting. Uh, but speaking of the Boston Symphony and my Lanceman, uh, uh, Leonidas Kavakos, he wrote his own for the mm -hmm. Beethoven Violin Concerto. He wrote his own and that was interesting to listen to because at least you could go, wow, he wrote it for himself. But they're just, it's just a, a fluff, really, you know, sorry. Well, you know, from a player's point of view, concerto, there's always that element of opposition with the orchestra. The orchestra makes a grand opening statement, usually, except for Sibelius concerto. The soloist waits to come in, has their say, back and forth, back and forth, and the cadenza is that one moment where the orchestra just says, okay, you can talk. <laughs> I'll give you a few minutes. Very um, and it sort of feels like, ah, oh, I, could, I could speak freely for a moment here. And yes, <laughs> there is that element of show-offiness, but um, a really great soloist will, will imbue it with something that feels more musical than just, oh, look what I can do. But okay, now that those guys are quiet, let's, right, let's right. hear one, one voice, but th those are traditional concertos. And as we come to more modern ones, I feel, I think you, you, George, called your second concerto, it was more of a democracy. 
orchestra. Right. And so on. right. It's That's a chamber orchestra. It, it's democratic and, and equal, and the and the soloist shares their their material with everybody to enjoy and play. You know. So. Mm. Yeah, I think you missed a question there, uh, Eric. There's a question after Jeremy's, but before that one. Michael Sherry. Oh, I cannot read one note of music, so my musical opinion is that of a layman, yet I hear these compositions and I hear a variety of themes and sounds similar to that of Jennifer Higdon's compositions. Okay, uh, is that a question? I'm not sure. I, <laughs> that's uh, I, can't be, because I don't really know Jennifer Higdon's music. I, I, I don't think I've heard a piece of hers, so uh, I guess not. But look, I mean, um, oh yeah, I did. When she was out at Aspen, she played a chamber work. Yes, I did. Uh, but that was a very different type of work and very good. Um, but, uh, you know, you're going to, uh, if you're listening to contemporary music that has line and is uh, not avant-garde, you're going to hear a lot of similarities from anything Bartok, B B Bernstein, uh, you know, um, Messiaen, in fact, you know, all these composers, there are things that, Compared to what a layman listens to every day, they're going to be in common with, you know, the things they hear in contemporary music. Like my music's nothing like uh, Shostakovich, but sometimes people, yeah, they don't know other music. So they go, wow, your music sounds like Shostakovich. Well, compared to, you know, the Kinks or, you know, uh, you know, David Bowie. Yeah, my music sounds like Shostakovich. But so that that the answer to the question is, you listen to new music and you listen to Eric's music or my music, you're going to find some things that are in common compared to what you're usually listening to, to I think. And we Is have one more question? question here. Have you always written with a long line in mind? No, I've tried to make my lines longer. And uh, Doug, hi, Doug. Um, I tried to make them longer because I realized that the longer they are, I think the more sophisticated a line is. Just the way a novel uh, compared to a, I mean, there are some wonderful short novels, but the novel compared to a short story, you can expand. Uh, not that I would try to get into Dostoevsky in lengths, but there is some sort of uh, admiration for longer thoughts and, and keeping one you know, involved a longer time. So I try to make those longer and longer. And then there's Robert Pape here. Oh. Yes, a nice comment. Good I don't have a question, but great. <laughs> Hi, Robert. Uh, nice, to, nice to get that message. Yeah. Good question. Well, yeah. well, I guess on that note, it's, it's, it's so great to have everyone here joining us tonight and to hear about your music, George, and thoughts about it and to hear some of it as well. And we're so looking forward to this performance in two weeks um, to hear uh, the Violin Concerto Number 3 come to Boston. So thank you so much and for being here. Occasionally, it's, it's, it's not too painful to talk about your own music. It doesn't happen as much as, uh, well, it shouldn't happen that much, but it's nice to, especially older pieces, to talk about them again. And Danny, I look forward to meeting you in person and you sound beautiful on that uh, on that recording video. I'm looking forward to hearing it and working with you, at least in the dress rehearsal. Sounds great. It's so much fun to talk with you and, and to meet you, at least on, on video. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Thank you. It's a delightful, delightful to meet you and to see Eric again. Yeah. See you soon. Okay. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.